Hello, folks. I want to introduce the outlaw, Rod Trent, most famously known for ramping a Bronco into a police department. He's a cloud security advocate for Microsoft and Microsoft Sentinel Global SME. He's done a little bit of everything on the technical and business sides of cybersecurity and himself has created and grown a conference, so we'll be looking for feedback when this is all over with. Um, he is a husband, a dad, and a first-time grandfather. So if you do have questions, please ask loudly so he can hear you. Thank you. Absolutely. Welcome. Uh, I kind of have to do that to start out. Make sure the mic is on so it kind of does sound like you can all hear me, right? Even everybody in the back, even though I can't see your faces. What? Yeah, exactly, <laughs> right? Um, <clears throat> thank you so much for coming to this event. Uh, I have to tell you, the wife and I driving up from around Dayton, Ohio today, it took about three hours. Um, I was a little surprised. I, my son, who's a drummer in a band called Urbania, um, he comes to Sweetwater a lot, at least once a year. It's like, like the Mecca, right, for a lot of musicians. I've never been here. I was surprised how absolutely fabulous this place is. So for those that live here, this is amazing, right? Uh, for those that are not here, I'm sure you're probably as awestruck as I am. So it's pretty cool. Um, I am Rod Trent. I am what they call a cloud security advocate with Microsoft. It's a weird title. We've all had weird professional titles in our career, right? The ones that literally mean nothing about what we do. Cloud security advocate, literally what this means is that at Microsoft, I sit between you, our customers, and you, our partners, and our product teams. I focused, hyper-focused on cybersecurity at Microsoft, Microsoft Sentinel, our Defender products, and things like that. But what I actually do is I'm a listener. I'm supposed to be a good listener. And this really works out well for me. When I married my wife, I married her because she's a really good talker. And I thought, you know, I'm just gonna be able to just sit back, let her in these social situations be able to talk. I can just kind of sit back and relax. Obviously I'm talking today, so eventually you kind of have to do things you're not uh, uh, comfortable with, but at the same time, I am a good listener and I've been a good listener for a long time. My wife can tell you that. Um, I do have to listen quite a bit. But in respect to that, the feedback that we get from, that I get from customers, and our partners, I take it directly back to the product teams, right? So I get to do kind of product manager type work, except I get to step away when all the politics come into play at Microsoft. So it's a really cool role. Um, but I say that to say this, uh, any feedback you have about our, our products at Microsoft, our security platforms and services, things like this, the more feedback you give me, the more it helps me. If you like me today and you're like, this Rod guy's kind of cool, I would love to help him in his career at Microsoft, please just hook up with me either today, right, after this, or um, I'll give you a slide here in a little bit about how to stay connected with me. Um, I'm a very public person. You can kind of see some of this stuff here. Uh, there's my LinkedIn profile, Twitter. Um, my email address is not difficult. It's rod.trent at microsoft.com, right? So you can email me with any feedback you have. And I see a lot of you taking pictures. Just don't stalk me, okay? Um, the other thing, and the reason why I kind of put this slide up here, I think I love delivering, talking about our solutions. I love talking about cybersecurity. I love helping out folks. I'm an educator. Um, but more than anything, when I do deliveries and presentations and sessions like this, this is my chance um, to talk about my grand boy. You see that picture? Every session I ever do, I always update it with the latest pictures. He's just turned one, so I've been a grandfather for just a little over a year. How many else, who else are, have that grandparent name attached to it? Yeah, see, you know what I'm talking about. So we knew the baby was coming, right? <clears throat> um, and you're like, yeah, I'm gonna have a baby, this is kind of cool. Uh, but I, I, that connection when that baby is born is just the absolute most amazing thing, right? So here I am, that's, that's my boy, his name is Reed. Um, I do a lot of other things, really kind of not important to what our topic is today, so I'll just leave that there. If you wanna take a picture of that, I think this slide deck will also be available for everyone to download. So if you uh, want that, instead of taking a picture, you'll have access to that as well. So <clears throat> the topic today is something that is very important to me. Something I think is probably important to a lot of security operations, whether you realize it 
or not. And we'll talk about that as we go along. The other thing about this is it's an OCD area of mine, efficiency. My wife will tell you this. I get frustrated if I do something that's not efficient. In fact, it's almost, uh, it's, it's one of those things where I'll literally just stop, right? If, it's, if I don't feel it's efficient enough, whatever it is I'm doing, whether it's personal, professional, whatever, I will stop, figure out a better way to do that, and then next time I'll try to do it a little bit more efficiently, right? It's like, uh, I can't do anything um, that's inefficient. This obviously sometimes is a blocker in my personal life, right? But professionally, I think this is absolutely important and critical to what I try to accomplish at Microsoft with our customers, um, trying to build efficiency into areas where a lot of our customers have not really thought about efficiency. And we'll talk about that as we go on. I think this is really, really important. And a lot of security operations centers, a lot of security teams don't even think about efficiency from that perspective. We have these tools. We have our favorite tools that we've used for years, right, to expose the potential threats within our environment. And unfortunately, um, because of the situation of security, how security continues to evolve itself, the threat actors continue to do different things, our security tools don't evolve along with them, right? So a lot of times we are kind of stuck in this mindset, stuck in this process, some of these policies where we're doing the same things over and over again, and we're, we, we, we feel like our security environment is absolutely secure because we're not getting those alerts that everybody else is getting, right? Great example, this is with the customer last week, we were discussing this. Uh, the unfortunate thing is they had been using some of those tools for like the last 10 years. We love our tools, we don't wanna do anything different. We, that organization hired people with that exact specific skill set for that specific tool, right? And, and companies do that, there's nothing wrong with that but it had created some bad habits for these, these, this customer, for the security team. Once they decided to, hey, let's try this other tool. It just happened to be a Microsoft tool. Let's try this tool, right? It, it looks at things a little bit differently. It takes a little bit different approach. It's kind of outside of our comfort level of what we're familiar and used to, but let's try this. Soon as they enabled that, things lit up in their environment. It caught things that their old tools did not catch because their old tools had not evolved to match the modern threat era, right? So we have to be careful about that. The other piece of this is, is some of those bad habits also um, force us, again, to work in a very specific path in a very specific way looking for threats where there's some things that we can do from an efficiency standpoint, use the modern technology to adapt and help us do our job quite a lot better, right? So we, we, we need to kind of take a look at that. So what I wanna talk about today is, is right before um, we deliver a session like this, or uh, sometimes I deliver workshops on this, you need to state what the problem is. So we're gonna state that very specifically here shortly. Um, then I wanna talk about some of those security operations center time drags that I've identified personally, but also identified in relation to our customers. Um, and then, uh, so I, I, I wanna take this approach too, and I just wanna be very mindful to understand, I understand this conference is an awesome event. Uh, this is super, just talking to the organizers, there's like over a hundred folks for this first event. That's amazing, that's awesome. This is only gonna grow, right? Um, but I do wanna uh, be mindful and let you know, I am from Microsoft, right? I am a Microsoft person. I've worked in sales, I've worked in marketing, but I'm neither of those. I am a technical person. My approach today, the things that I wanna talk about, even though I will use Microsoft products as the examples and the demonstrations, right, to show you these things, these are areas of efficiency that I believe that each security team can kind of take a look at and whatever tool it is that you use, take a look at that tool and figure out how to um, administer that level of efficiency for those different areas. These are things that we can all kind of take a look at. I wanna give you some ideas today of some things that you can take back and um, potentially implement within your environment or at least idealize or even sometimes um, take a look at your tool and say, well, hmm, my tool can't do that. This sounds like something I need to do, but my tool can't do that. So maybe it's time just to reach out just a little bit and look at other things, all right? And um, so I'm gonna talk for a little bit, but then I'm gonna spend the majority of the time actually in my own demo environment. We'll switch back and forth between slides as long as it works correctly. If it doesn't, I always have backup plans. So it should work, should be just fine, but I wanna show you these efficiencies, what they look like within an actual tool and where those might actually exist. So let's state our problem. Um, these tools 
have been in use. Uh, I think I remember uh, the first time I ever heard of Splunk. I thought it was just like the most amazing product name, right? That's just kind of cool. Splunk, and, and I know what it is. It's like Splunking, everybody remember, you know, you're going diving, caving, cave diving, looking for something, almost like treasure or whatever, if you will. But these tools have been in place for the past 10, 12 years, something like this. Organizations have used these tools and become very comfortable with them. Understanding they hire people, there's very specific skill sets, right, for using things like Splunk, Curator, Logarithm, all the CrowdStrike, all the familiar ones. But based on a survey and working with a number of different customers early on in Microsoft's lifecycle of security, um, we pulled out this average number, how long it took for an organization to actually detect, right? It took 120 hours to detect something within their environment. This is the average, by the way. This may not be in your environment, but all compiled together, this is the average. Five hours to triage, right? So triage, everybody knows what that is. That's just even deciding if you need to do something after you've detected it, right? Was it the CEO? Was it this, you know, whoever it happened to be, we need to determine if we're actually going to, five hours. Right? I'm sure there's a lot of politics that's in that, right? Security team, network team, um, HR, they're all kind of fighting together to figure out if they want to lock this person out of their account or whatever. Um, it took, in the investigation phase, took six hours, right? And then finally, to resolve the situation, after they determined that they actually needed to do something about it, they went through the investigation to pull the storyline together to figure out where the intrusion was all the way through um, to what they needed to mitigate. Um, that remediation took 31 hours to accomplish. These are probably some pretty large environments, but still, that's a long time. 162 total hours. And keep in mind, this is not every security event in that, in that environment over the past 24 hours. This is literally one, right? 162 hours. Imagine some of these complex, massive environments. 162 hours for one. Uh, I was talking to an individual earlier, works at Walmart. I can't even imagine the number of security events that they have to dig through and look through every single day, right? So that's huge. Who has heard of the 11060 rule? Anyone heard this? Ah, okay. 11060 rule is, is a way for us to simplify that 162 hours. And, and potentially, there was this rule that was proposed, I think it was about five or six years ago. Um, if I have my, my dates correct, um, the idea here was we need to envision where we want to be with security. The idea was that we should be able to detect whatever that thing is, right? Within a minute, we need to perform our investigation, right? Within 10 minutes, and then ultimately remediate within an hour. And that's for every alert, all right? So that sounds awesome, doesn't it? Compared to the 162 hours, sounds pretty good. Um, and, and that's like ideal. That's the Eden, right? That's the paradise of security. Um, that's where our analyst literally is using this tool and, and they're able to accomplish exactly what they need to accomplish to identify those exposures in our environment. So if we compare what we just talked about, six and three quarter days for one uh, event to 71 minutes, that sounds pretty good, right? That's a big improvement. Understanding 162 hours is the actual average one hour and 11 minutes is what we propose and hope to get be able to get to from our goal and in fact that was just literally a goal where we need to get to when the tools could catch up with security again we're still using tools um, that couldn't do the job that we needed to do now let's kind of throw this into the mix just a little bit these working with customers and working as an analyst myself and other organizations these are the things that you absolutely simply must do as part of that security operations center. Some of you, depending on your environment, depending on what um, devices, application services that you have within your environment, some of these you'll have more, some of you will have less, but this is kind of the general rule, right? So you must investigate, right? Alerts generate, we get these incidents, we get the storyline potentially of what happened, you have to absolutely investigate. I list out some things here, um, just throwing some of this stuff together, workbooks, that's just really reporting. Um, the incidents themselves, the events and the alerts. Um, one, a lot of uh, occurrences within the environment, right, is going to generate multiple alerts. How many have dealt with like hundreds of alerts before? 
right? Yeah, hundreds of alerts when if you start looking at the alerts, they're kind of, they're not unique. They should be somehow coupled together. Wouldn't it be great if our tool, if our, our actual uh, technology could do that for us? We'll talk about that here in a minute. Um, those entities, that user account, those host names, those IP addresses, all those things that are important and pieces of collateral and evidence for investigations, we have to, a lot of times, manually collect that enrichment, don't we? Right? So that's another thing that absolutely must be done as part of this investigation life cycle. So you're starting to take a look at those at 162 hours again. You're going, okay, now I can kind of see it. That really, that really is what's involved there. And then also adding context. We were talking earlier at lunch too, and I appreciate that. Give me something else to talk about. Um, talking about at lunch, how you'll get an alert, but you only kind of react when that alert happens. And there's this whole storyline that you miss if your tool doesn't collect that stuff for you. That information is in log files somewhere. You may not be collecting that log file. You may, but you may not have anything within that tool of yours looking at that to actually tie that together. So you're dealing with an alert where you're dealing with an actual intrusion or exposure when it actually happened over here. It started over here on this timeline. And unless you have that information, you have to spend that extra time in that investigation to go back and, and hunt that stuff down yourself. So that's, that's kind of it's part of the process. And that's what takes helps you know, add to the amount of time that we uh, have to utilize for investigation. Hunting. Oh, my goodness. Uh, this is a soapbox moment for me. I'm going to try to keep it short because we don't have a lot of time. Um, those tools I talked about, those tools that everybody has used uh, for their security operations center for years, I've worked with a number of customers where those tools made hunting. Everybody still hunts, right? Hunting operations, I see one, two. How many don't anymore? How many have done it in the past and just stopped doing it? I see it, yeah, maybe. He's shrugging, he's like, yeah, but I don't wanna tell everybody. Um, <laughs> hunting is absolutely important. Hunting is, gives you, your organization, that ability to take a look at your environment between the time that a new threat is announced and you have the threat intelligence to report on it, right? Hunting is absolutely important to identify those things. I've worked with a number of customers that because of those tools, because it's made them absolutely so difficult, they have stopped hunting, right? And so six months, you know, after they stopped hunting, you say they start to do a little hunting, they're like, holy crap, right? We missed a lot of stuff because we couldn't do this. It just made it absolutely so difficult that they just stopped doing it. They, every organization based on policies, politics, whatever, sometimes your security teams are taxed and tasked with other things other than security, which is sad, right? Um, so hunting just kind of literally got pushed to the side and that's, that's unfortunate. So we still need to be able to do hunting. We absolutely, our tools should be able to do a lot of some of this heavy lifting for us so that we can still do that hunting or at least have someone in our security organization be able to do that hunting. Evolution of our security operations. We talked about those other tools that literally have not evolved with the threats. Um, our tool should give us the ability to either evolve on its own, pull in threat intel from somewhere and update accordingly, so that's always looking for the most current information, right, through our log files, or it should give us the ability to do that. Um, a lot of these tools have not given us that capability. And again, just like hunting, our security tools have not evolved because it's not given us the ability to do that because it, it has not allowed us to streamline those other operations, right? These are all the things that absolutely, absolutely must be done but a lot of these things are kind of thrown by the wayside because they can't be accomplished in the time and in allotment that we have. So some of the current security efficiency hunt complaints I hear from customers. Connecting data is brutally difficult. Every time you get in a new switch or a new device in your environment, it has a log file. Connecting data to your tool is probably the most difficult thing that you can do, right? The vendor, nobody is uniform in any way. Their log files, they'll stick an IP address in some weird column name, and now you're like stuck trying to figure out how to correlate that information. Um, data is really difficult to connect. Um, the hunting, we talked about too time consuming. The evolution is non-existent. Um, what else? Um, the investigated context, which we'll talk about here shortly. Um, and that threat intelligence, TI. A lot of times we're kind of tasked also with manually locating our trusted TI sources. 
Um, and that takes a big effort. You almost need one person to be able to do that, right? Um, but that's not available. So the bottom line is, and I'm going to tell you this, right? Um, all these things are absolutely possible. And we'll talk about that as we go along. And I'm not saying your tool can't do it. I'm going to use Microsoft Sentinel to show you where to locate these efficiencies here. But you need to go back and take a look at the tool you're using to make sure that you can also do these things. Um, or at least plan, right? Six months to a year from now, um, it, it, you should kind of plan to be in a different place if some of these things are not efficient in your environment to be able to accomplish this. Um, but these are absolutely important. These are the things that I'd like to demo today. Let me take a look at the time. Um, you guys didn't know what you're in for today. I literally talk weeks at a time sometimes. I can not stop talking. So I'm going to try to keep us under time today um, and leave some time for questions. And as we go along, if you do have questions, please just go ahead, raise your hand. Um, don't be afraid of everybody else in here. We're all, we're all like people, right? Like-minded. We're security folks. So you can ask those questions and I would be happy to answer those. In fact, I love when these sessions are actually driven by your questions more so than me just kind of like taking the helm and just doing things, okay? So keep that in mind as we go along. These are the things that I want to kind of switch back and forth and kind of show you some things uh, within, again, using Sentinel as a tool, but with the idea that these are things that you can kind of look at within your own environment to improve on these efficiencies. Um, the first thing, uh, a lot of these tools um, are complex in the way that they are deployed. Right? You have to stand up servers, VMs, um, you have to configure the architecture, the network, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the other piece of this is that when these solutions are updated, uh, this is unfortunate, some of them you actually have to take down while you upgrade the system. For the length of time that you have these systems down, you have what? A security gap, right? time gap there for potential security where you're not being monitored. That's unfortunate. Um, we live kind of in a modern world. How many uh, organizations represented here are using little or a little bit or even a lot of the, the cloud, one cloud or another? That's awesome. I won't ask the other one. I don't want to embarrass anybody. But, uh, no, uh, I won't ask it the opposite way. Um, the cloud gives us the ability to be able to take advantage of resources, particularly from security, that we wouldn't have on-prem, right? And, and those things that we, those workloads that we deploy in the cloud, they're generally elastic. They, we can send as much data or as little data as we, as we send. They're just literally going to be able to take that. Um, I know a lot of the security tools that I'm talking about for security operations centers, the SIEMs, SIMS, however you want to pronounce it, everybody pronounces it differently. Um, they're... They do have cloud models these days, right? So obviously Microsoft will use Azure. I'll tell you a little secret. Um, so I, I talk about Microsoft Sentinel a lot. That's what I'm focused on at Microsoft. Microsoft didn't use Microsoft Sentinel even internally ex until like a couple years ago, right? We used other tools that you probably have heard of. Um, QRadar, Logarithm, uh, Splunk. Uh, because Microsoft Sentinel is like the new kid on the block, right? We were kind of waiting a little bit. We do use it now, um, but so I'm very familiar with those other tools. Um, I know what capability they have. I know where they're hosted, like Splunk is, is actually AWS, right? They host their stuff in there. Um, and, but everybody is kind of seeing the, um, uh, the, the goodness of the cloud, I guess, to be able to take advantage of those, those resources. Um, the one thing I wanna, I wanna show you real quick uh, about Microsoft, and again, using Microsoft Sentinel to do this. Splunk does this as well. If you use Splunk Cloud, um, it takes a lot less time to deploy, right, than it used to. Um, Microsoft Sentinel, um, all we need is a log analytics workspace. Everybody familiar with log analytics workspaces? It's the data, almost like the database for Azure. Um, I have a couple listed here. I just want to show you how quickly it is. Um, I'm just going to click add real quick, and while I'm talking, it's actually going to take less time for me to uh, it's less time to set up, probably if our Wi-Fi is good. There you go. I now have Microsoft Sentinel stood up, right? So the importance of this is not just, oh yeah, this is really cool. Um, the importance here is, depending on your organization, you have a lot of different, maybe you have remote offices, you have different architectures, you need to deploy your tool to be able to manage and monitor from a bunch of different resources, right? Maybe your company acquired another company. 
Maybe you have other offices. Maybe you have an HR group that literally does not um, want your security analyst, this happens all the time, to be able to view personnel data, right? So you need to deploy something very specific to that environment, right? Um, the beauty of this is because we're stood up, we've stood up in like five minutes, you can deploy an entire, across your entire organization in literally no time. That's the beauty of utilizing the cloud for these types of services. Another piece of this, which I won't necessarily talk about, but that threat intel, and I want to bring this up because we've talked about that already, that TI, that threat intelligence, and the machine learning and the artificial intelligence that's built into the cloud, you're able to take advantage of that stuff for your security operations, right? So I can stand this up in a quick amount of time. I can connect my TI sources directly to the cloud. So those are always going to be updated. The other really cool piece of this, you can pull threat intel from literally anywhere. Um, how many, I'm just going to ask, how many people use some Microsoft security product today? Like Defender, Security Cloud, or something like that? Um, you've probably heard this before. You may not realize it. Um, but the more that you use our services like Office 365, the more you're actually helping yourself. Um, Office 365 and all of our other services, even Azure, collects signals, right? Threat signals actually happen to be within those data streams. At Microsoft, we actually take those signals. It's, I think it's up to like 24 trillion signals a day or something like this. The more customers use it, the more signals we get. It's actually fed back into the system, all of our um, ML models within um, these threat intel. So the cool thing about that is, is that um, not only is it easy to stand up, every time you open up this console, and when you use a console like this, Splunk even does this on the cloud, you don't have to do those upgrades yourself anymore, right? It's automatically upgraded. Anytime you open that console, you're always gonna get the most current version of that product. You're also always gonna get the most current version of the threat intelligence, right? Whether you're using Office 365 stuff or using threat intel from somewhere else, it's always up to date. Talking about evolving security operations, make sure it's evolving with the threat actors, that's huge, right? So if you're always using the most current information and your tool is using the most current information, you're always gonna be capturing that, that latest thing, right? From, I don't know, Russia, Ukraine, all these, these nation state actors and stuff like this that are just nefarious, right? You're always gonna be covered for this stuff. You're gonna see those alerts and uh, ensure that your environment is absolutely covered. So that's huge from utilizing the cloud. And, and if anything, any point I would put there and, and something you could take away from this is if you're not using the cloud for your security operations today, take advantage of the cloud and those different types of technologies. Think about it, right? This is, um, this is a really, really interesting, good area from a data science perspective, but also security perspective, utilizing the power of the cloud. Because you literally, it's pay as you go, you use as little or as much of it that you want. The next thing, remember we talked about those things that we, uh, uh, those pain points. One of those is connecting data, right? So difficult, I saw a lot of head nods when I was talking about that, how difficult it is to connect. Not just difficult to connect, but also then difficult to correlate the data, right? You need to query that data. You need to know where those, that data exists. You need to know what those column names are. You need to know what the schema looks like. Schema can change. Um, it's helping a cu customer with um, a Meraki, Meraki device recently. Oh my goodness. Oh, I see smiles already. You know what I'm talking about. Um, you do a firmware upgrade on a Meraki device, they'll change the schema on you. Oh my goodness. Um, so then you have to go back through and do all this other stuff to figure it out. We have some things um, within Microsoft Defender and also Sentinel. Um, it's, it's kind of a new thing that we're doing. It's the correlation of the data in a much kind of nicer, meaningful way. We'll look through that Meraki log and find that IP address, even if they put it in some silly column name, and we will correlate that data so it will always be available. So not just connecting the data, but um, looking through it. Um, I'm going to show you a couple. I'm going to go to the next one here and just show you this is something that's brand new. Um, well, within the past six months, anything brand new with the Microsoft products, it's within the past six months or so. Um, and, and I'm going to talk about this first, and then I'll demo this. but. Um, Connected data is important, but also what we've done here recently in the content hub within Microsoft Sentinel, I'll show you. Um, when you connect that data, not only do you get that data connector, but you get that parser. So it knows the data, right? So it's automatically parsing. You get the rules that looks for those things from that original vendor. Vendor says, hey, this, these are what 
This is what gets exposed from our log files. This is what you need to look for. You're going to get those rules with it. You'll get rules, you get reporting through our workbooks, everything. So it's a little bit different. In the past, it was literally just connecting data, and then you kind of had to figure everything out, right? You had to figure out, I need to enable this rule, I need to make a rule for this, to look for this. But now what we're doing with solutions um, is pulling that all together. So I've got my brand new, um, here we go. I've got my brand new Microsoft Sentinel instance stood up. First thing I want to do, and probably first thing every customer always wants to do, um, correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think I'm right. Um, we can be just, we can have the most amazing security engineers in our environment that are really good at securing those ports and our network devices and our devices and stuff like that, our um, the workstations and our servers. Um, but our biggest gap in security is always going to be what? Users, right? It doesn't matter how good we are. Um, at securing all of these things that we're, you know, we're in charge of, we're responsible for. Um, it's that one user, right? That one user that, um, I don't know, uh, probably complains the most in the environment. You're like, oh my goodness, right? Um, so one of the things that customers do, right, with uh, when they stand up something like Sentinel, uh, Splunk's the same way, right? If you use Splunk, um, Curator's the same. They have the add-ons and connectors to be able to pull through the API for Office 365. Of course, you have to pay for egress for that. In Sentinel, it's, it's free. Um, but I'll show you how quickly it is to be able to connect something like this. Even Splunk, it's a few clicks. So I want to enable Office 365 immediately because I know I, my users are just whack, right? They do weird things. They click on things I tell them not to. They're downloading uh, this Steam game on their corporate PC, and it's got malware attached. Everybody knows that. Um, so. Uh, what I've done is that it, it's absolutely that easy. I just literally click three boxes and now I have Exchange, SharePoint, which includes OneDrive, and Teams in, in connected to Sentinel. And now within, and we'll come back here in a little bit, this last log received, it's not going to take very, much, very long, probably less than five minutes, and we start to have that data flow in automatically. Um, the other piece I just re-highlight is th it's, it's a free connection, right? It's cloud to cloud. It's Office 365 to Sentinel, so it's free. Um, if you use it in Splunk, obviously you're paying for uh, the egress cost for API, um, but it still works. Uh, still works awesome. It's the same API. We're using the same API that that uh, across the board. The other piece of this, which I think is absolutely amazing to me, um, I, some people might think this is silly, but I want to highlight this. See that prerequisites thing up top? It knows me when I want to enable this connector. It knows my logged in user account. It automatically goes through the checks. It says, yep, you've got the workspace permissions you need. You've got the tenant permissions you need on the Office 365 side. You're good. You can go ahead and enable this. Um, a lot of times, particularly with that API, if you're pulling that API into some other tool, you have to go through this whole process of making sure you have the access. And if you're not an administrator on the Office 365 side, you have to contact that administrator, right? And then you have kind of have, it takes a long time to connect this stuff. But what's the beauty of this, it automatically checks and makes sure I have all the appropriate rights and, and everything I need to be able to connect this stuff. You may think that's silly, but that's efficiency, right? That improves that efficiency. I can do this in, in a much uh, quicker manner. Going to the uh, solutions, and I just wanted to show you that real quick um, because a lot of organizations, a lot of um, other tools are starting to do this as well. It, we're not the first. Uh, we're just um, following everybody else, really. Uh, what's a good one? Who uses CrowdStrike? There you go. Um, this, even though it says Microsoft Corporation right there, this is actually uh, co-developed with CrowdStrike. Uh, CrowdStrike is more along the lines, of probably some folks use Tanium as well, um, but produces those, looks through those same log files, looks through those events, and then forwards it somewhere um, to the CrowdStrike environment, and this actually pulls in from CrowdStrike. The beauty of this is that you can use CrowdStrike with Sentinel. Sentinel is gonna pull in the Office 365 stuff, Right? It's going to pull, it can pull in your Cisco, if you're a Cisco shop, your Palo Alto stuff. It's going to pull in the rest of your environment. Now you can take CrowdStrike, integrate it with all of those other sources in this SIEM environment, and Sentinel is going to take a look at that and tie, remember I was talking about that timeline of how things happen and we only know about this one? It's going to take that entire environment with CrowdStrike, with that CrowdStrike alert, and tie that entire storyline together so you know where that intrusion happened. You know where that, what that user clicked on in that, you know, 
crazy event or whatever. So we have um, these solutions. So if I pull something out like uh, about for this, you'll see down here. Um, so the data connectors included, you see those content types, two analytics rules with this, right? Two data connectors, uh, two parsers, because obviously we're connecting two pieces of data from CrowdStrike, um, five play, uh, playbooks, which is some automation that's going on here to help enhance our uh, efficiency and uh, some reporting. It's got a workbook. It's going to tell you what, what Sentinel and CrowdStrike are doing together to um, complete that uh, full environment. Any questions so far? Yes, sir. Yeah. It's what that tool needs um, to do some things. I think there's, uh, um, um, there's a little service now component in there and stuff like that as well, yeah. Yes, sir. So you said between 365 and Sentinel, there's basically no associated reference. Right, Office 365, there's, there's a number of um, what we call first party, or Microsoft sources that are free. Um, okay. Azure Activity, Log, um, Office 365, our Defender alerts, so all those Defender, you know, and security.microsoft.com, um, the alerts. Azure AD. Um, so Azure AD is not free unless you're an E5 customer, and then it is. E5, um, and it's not just E5, it's all the fives. So there's E5, M5, A5, G5, that's all the fives, I can make some up and you wouldn't know the difference, but yeah. All the fives, and you get Azure Active Directory for free. And, and I have to tell you, um, uh, should I tell you this? We're on live stream. Anyway, Azure Active Directory is absolutely critical. It is. Um, I think we should make it free for everybody, but yeah, we'll see. Yeah, absolutely, it's that critical. All right, data analysis. Um, yes, sir, sorry. So we have two agents, you know this, right? Okay, we have one that's gonna be deprecated in August of 2024. I say that because a lot of people are like, I need to migrate right now, this new agent. You don't, don't worry about it. Um, so we have this Azure Monitor agent, which is the future of agents. It's, it's actually much better, much kinder uh, for performance, connection, ingest, filtering. You know, filtering is huge for cost, right? Um, and there's also the uh, Microsoft Management Agent, which is the one that initially started with SCOM, System Center Operations Manager for those environments, um, and has come up to this point. Uh, you can install it, both of those agents on Linux boxes and Windows boxes, right? Uh, the only drawback for Linux for the old agent is that it's, mul it's not multi-home, right? So you can only send to one log analytics workspace or whatever for that Linux agent. Um, if you use VMs in Azure, whether it's Linux or Windows. Um, there's extensions, you know, extensions are utilized within Azure, right? So we're not installing agents, we're installing, we're installing extensions, which is uh, actually a security thing, if you think about it. Extensions run outside of that VM environment, so that keeps that VM environment secure. If that agent, something happens to that agent, we just redeploy that agent. It doesn't even affect that environment at all. So that's the beauty of using VMs in in Azure. Um, but yeah, the agent, you can deploy that across, you can deploy it on-prem, you can deploy it in Azure, you can take those agents, deploy it in AWS, in GCP, whatever. Um, the beauty about Sentinel, and I should kind of note this, everybody knows that Microsoft rebrands things like every six months, right? All right. I'm not even gonna tell you what the next rebrand's gonna be. Um, you'll get mad at me and you'll never ask me back. Um, but we just had this whole Defender thing. The, uh, Azure Security Center was renamed Defender for Cloud. Um, Microsoft Sentinel was renamed from Azure Sentinel. The intent for this is that these products actually secure more than just Microsoft resources and Microsoft stuff. You can connect AWS, GCP, whatever cloud, Oracle Cloud. I was waiting for that. I've heard that actually recently. Hey, we use Oracle Cloud. I'm like, what? I didn't know that was still a thing. Um, I'm sorry, does anybody use Oracle Cloud? Okay, good. Whew. All right, um, but you can connect anything from anywhere. And, and shouldn't that, and really, shouldn't our tool be able to do that? Our tool should be able to literally connect anything from anywhere because if, if it can't, 
we have at least one security gap in our environment, right? But if I can't connect AWS to my current existing tool easily and it's readable, the tool can actually read the data and stuff, then I have a security gap in my environment. And it's, it's sad when the actual security tool creates the security gap, right? So you gotta be careful about that. Uh, data analysis. Oh, any other questions? Sorry. Okay, did I answer your question by the way? Yes, thumbs up, excellent. One thumbs up, two thumbs up? Two thumbs up, excellent. Now I feel good. All right, data analysis. Uh, I'm gonna just go ahead to this. I'm looking at the time. Okay, uh, I'm just gonna stick this up here real quick. Um, <clears throat> what we do within, and, and let's do this. What we do within Microsoft Sentinel, everybody, you may not have heard of this, but there's this open source language, query language called Kusto or KQL, Kusto query language. Um, it's absolutely, it, it's, I'll put it this way, KQL is the next PowerShell. Remember when PowerShell first came out and you're like, everybody has to learn this, it's amazing, we gotta, well, KQL is that next thing, right? Even though it's not a scripting environment, it's a query environment, um, it's, it's that important to learn. If you're gonna work with anything, um, KQL, Kusto, is a Microsoft invention. It was invented by four uh, people in our data science group. Um, I know each one of them, they're actually good folks. Um, and, and it's a very simple, easy query language to learn. I say that because anything within Azure, and here very shortly, um, QRadar is gonna start using Kusto and KQL to be able to query their scene, right? Um, it's that important to learn. Anything data-centric within Azure, and here soon QRadar, um, uses KQL. Even in Microsoft Sentinel, which we're talking about here, this tool, even in the security.microsoft.com console, if you do advanced hunting, that's KQL. That's that query language, right? Um, everything that we have within Sentinel, like our analytics, this data analysis, right? These analytics rules, um, our workbooks, um, our hunting queries, it's all powered by this KQL, all right? So it's, and, it, and the reason why I mention this as an efficiency thing, I worked with a company a couple years ago, um, and it was a uh, local government, and they were using QRadar. They had an SLA. Law enforcement would come to them and say, uh, we need data on this, okay? The SLA for that was once that request was made, they could expect the return three days. That was the SLA. Because that query language so was so difficult to use and um, it used so many resources that it literally did take that long. And of course, they had lots of data, right? But at the same time, how many of us literally have logs and logs and logs and logs and logs, right? We have lots of data that we have to filter through, have lots of data that we have to look for, have to weed out the performance and, and metrics, and we need to find the security stuff. Um, the importance and efficiency from this KQL is that it literally uses clustering and compute of the cloud to be able to return those results very, 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 very quickly, right? So what, what would take three days for this local government, I stood, took their data, stuck it in Sentinel and used KQL and it literally came back um, within 15 minutes, same data, right? So they could, I, I don't know if they wanted to do that. I think they really liked their SLA where they could just like, like stick it in there and just, yeah, let's just wait for it to finish. Um, but at the same time as security people, and we know that there's an exposure in the environment for whatever reason, we know it. Um, we need that information to come back extremely quickly, wouldn't you say, right? If we have a gap, if we have a security event within our environment, we need to know all about that really quickly. So this query language is actually designed to use the power of the cloud to be able to automatically grab that clustering. And the other thing about this is that the, the querying within Azure is, is, that's another good thing. If you're interested, well, you should be, if you go to aka.ms slash must learn KQL, there's a whole series um, to get started on KQL. I will let, let you take that picture. All right, um, we're getting close, got about 15 minutes, so I wanna be mindful of everyone else's time as well. So let's talk through some of these things. Again, the workbooks, the reporting, from an efficiency standpoint, you should be able to create these, the, this reporting very quickly as well, right? In the past, it's like, oh my goodness, I have all this data. What tool am I going to use for the reporting? A lot of organizations, because of the types of data and the way the data was retained and stored, how many have used Excel to look through data for security purposes? Yeah, right. Um, 
as much as, well, I'll have to tell you, I hate Excel. I really don't like it. Um, I've worked with a number of customers who, who, again, using those old tools, they've used Excel, they're very comfortable with that. Uh, they start using something like Sentinel or something cloud-based like Splunk, and they ask, how can I export my data to Excel? Because they want to go back and do it the old way. You don't have to do that anymore, right? Um, it should be, from an efficiency standpoint, these tools should absolutely be built in, should be able to use what you have. And again, these workbooks are built on that KQL, on that Custo query language. Um, if I jumped into one here, uh, I'm not going to because of time constraints, but if I jumped into one here and went into edit mode, you're going to look and you'll see the exact same KQL language that's in our analytics rules and our hunting queries is right there in the code for these workbooks. So literally, you create your query, you produce the data that the results that you want to see, you stick it in a workbook, and now it's a report. You can share it with your manager, right? Could be SOC mean time or something. Show your manager how well your SOC is performing. Um, it could be something like your NetFlow logs. Let's see how much data we have. Let's see how much that data is costing us. You can actually create costing reports uh, very quickly. Um, for those workbooks. And again, this is a sentinel thing I'm talking about, but this should be across the board, right, for all these tools. Reporting should be really easy. Um, I'll say another thing that I shouldn't say as a Microsoft person. I hate Power BI. It's the, oh my goodness. Um, managers love Power BI because it's pretty, right? So you, even with this KQL query language, you can export this directly to a Power BI so you can take your workbook and Stick it in Power BI so your manager would absolutely love you. Um, investigation. We've talked about this early on, but again, I want to re-highlight this. This investigation should have enough information in there for you to be able to do something with it right now instead of providing so much additional enrichment how you kind of had to manually do that in the past. Things like, um, and everybody will know this, it's easy to collect IP addresses, right? So you collect usernames, host names, whatever. Um, but what about the geolocation of that IP address, right? You have to do a little extra data enrichment sometimes to get that geolocation. Um, that needs to be included, right? Wouldn't it be absolutely awesome if that could be included as part, if you could collect everything. If you decided that this is absolutely what I need to solve this potential crisis in our environment, this is the data that I need, right? Wouldn't it be nice just to be able to select that data and say, okay, next time that this incident gets generated, this bucket of information, it has every artifact, every piece that I need, right? Using the power of the cloud, using things like, and I want to switch over here real quick. I want to show this one. I think this one's important. Um, using things, uh, one of the things that we, as we started developing Sentinel early on, um, this SOAR capability, security orchestration, automation, remediation, some people say response for the R. Um, but this automation, this is a streamlined component, right? This is, this is efficiency if you do it right. The idea here is that, and I'm gonna switch back to my own workspace because I know it's in there. Um, we thought early on from an efficiency standpoint that automation should absolutely built in, be built into the product. Um, some products today even still, uh, they do have the SOAR capability or maybe they use external SOAR capabilities from another vendor, they tie together. Sometimes not great, but they tie together. Um, but what I'm going to show you here, yeah, this is the one I want. So this is what I call IP address geo to comments. And literally what this does, I use ip-api.com. IP that's where I get my geolocation information. Literally takes that IP address from that incident that's already built into the incident takes that IP address automatically, sticks it out to that API for IP-API.com and pulls in that enrichment data and puts it, in my, puts it in my incident. Let me show you how that works here real quick. Have a few incidents here. Nothing real significant. PowerShell execution. PowerShell is absolutely powerful, but in the wrong hands, right? Um, I should have an IP address here. I don't. So now I have to go back and fix that later. Um, I do have one here, positive that I'm going to have one here. So what I can do here in this one, because in my entities here, I do have, I have a user account, this Rod Trent, whoever the heck he happens to be, don't know about this guy. He has an IP address that he did whatever this thing was. There's some other collateral there that's going to be important for my investigation. I want to get that geolocation for that 
Yeah, it can be here. It would help with like a type. Um, to comments, uh, da, 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 da. let's run this one. And now I go back to this instant. I may have run, run the wrong one, I apologize. Um, let's go ahead and refresh. Yeah, I probably did. Let me run the other one. But I just wanna show you how simple and easy it is to run these things. Um, but the other piece of this, and we're talking about efficiency. So you're seeing me do a lot of manual work here. Um, but it doesn't have to be manual. Let's go back to that instant. Could be the, uh, oh, there it is. So this, uh, this went out to, took that IP address, stuck it out to ip-api.com. You may use your own IP API somewhere else. Um, took that IP address, oops, guess what? I just gave away where I live exactly and what ISP that I use. But isn't that cool information? Yeah. <clears throat> you just saw me do that manually though, right? Um, cool thing about this is that next time, um, it actually goes down here and it tells me the rule that created this event. I can go into this event, into this rule, and go to the automated response tab. Um, and I can select that playbook. That one is the one that I need to fix the other one. And I, the next time that this gets generated in the system, this is a silly one, it could be anything. Um, I don't have to do that manual thing anymore. Next time that this runs, that IP address, that geolocation, that IP address is gonna automatically be in there because I determined, guess what? That's important for me, I need to know. Um, my CEO keeps connecting from Brazil when I know he's in California. That's, you know, it's kind of significant, right? So if I, that shows up, I know something, something's screwy and something's wrong. Another piece of this automation um, helps with that remediation or at least protects the environment. One of the things that we have templates for is, um, for example, if someone logs, uh, logs uh, attempts to log in unsuccessfully, a hundred times within five minutes, and then all of a sudden there's success. So 4625 for a hundred times, and 4624 for one time. What is that? Right, password spray or something, right? Um, but I can create automation that when that happens, it automatically quarantines that, sticks it in a network security group, quarantines that from the rest of the environment. It could be my CEO, but I have been hired to do the due diligence and keep my environment secure, right? Um, I don't care if it's CEO, he may fire me, right? But at the same time, I'll go to that next employer and I say, you know what? I'll go to that security conscious CEO and I say, I did this at my last um, job, at my last role, and I saved the company. They hated me for it because it was a CEO, because some CEOs are, no CEOs in here, right? All right, all right, you're, you're all good people. Um, you just do weird things. Uh, <clears throat> but go to that security conscious CEO and he hires me and says, you're like the best person. So it's, it's, a, it's a career builder, right? Um, so not only do we get to build efficiency, but we get to secure our environment and do it from an efficient standpoint so I can still do those other tasks that are important to me. Uh, we are, how much time we have? Seven minutes. So it is, okay. Any other questions before we move? All right, no questions. Any comments? All right, anybody gonna go, go Rod? Okay, sorry, trying to get something from you guys. You can do it. Thank you. You can do it. That's so good. All right, uh, the hunting. Um, not only do we want to build efficiency so we can still do hunting, but one of the things that we at Microsoft that we've been very mindful about um, and engineered very specifically into Sentinel, and I know a lot of other um, organizations, a lot of other companies are doing this as well, is building efficiency into the hunting process. Um, larger organizations have security operations centers, have those security teams where you have kind of those diverse roles and responsibilities, right? You have your um, investigative analysts, you have your hunting analysts, um, but this hunting piece, which has become so difficult because it's been so excruciating and painful, there's even some capabilities built into Sentinel here um, where we even make that a little bit better of efficiency. So you not only in the past, this hunting operation, right? So you'll take, it's partially a research um, role and task, but it's also partially searching and looking for those things. You're looking for indicators of compromise, 
that have been reported somewhere to see if it might exist in your environment. And if it does, you're going to do something about it. It's, again, outside of the realm of what is going to be generated from alert automatically. You can turn that stuff into um, the automatic alert generation in the future if you decide and you determine that it's something that absolutely exists within your environment. But we do some things within the hunting operation. So that thing that sometimes took three days to do from a hunting perspective, you can actually, at a glance, um, do within half a day if you do it properly. Some people do it in like 30 minutes, which I don't recommend, um, but you can do this in like half a day versus three days uh, on average that it would take for some other tools or at least some other tools in the past. Um, if you're interested in this, uh, we're again, kind of short on time, but if you're interested in this, hook up with me and I'll show you all this stuff. Absolutely love to talk about this. Um, efficiency, uh, we call these watch lists. Um, other people call them trusted lists, deny lists. I think in the past people used to say whitelisting, blacklisting. It's the same stuff, right? Um, but to build efficiency in the Security Operations Center, these are important, right? So I usually like to use things like trusted lists, like trusted individuals. I have my administrators in my environment that I know need to be able to cert do certain things within the environment from an administrative perspective. My rules are going to catch anyone that does these things, right? These administrative functions. But I trust these people. I'm going to create a list so that my rules takes two lines of code to stick into that initial analytics rule with that KQL query. Um, every time that that thing runs and that thing happens that I'm looking for within my environment, it's going to look through my trusted list first. And, and if those are the people that are performing that action, it's going to skip them. It's still going to be recorded in my data, if I want to go back and create a report of all the people that did that over time, I'm, I can create that report. But at the same time, I don't want my analyst to be notified when my um, cloud administrator create, you know, spins up a VM. It's not important to me because he should be able to be able to do that without us, you know, what are you doing? Right. Um, so watch list, very important. Um, this is huge. A lot of tools are doing this now. It, it was originally called user entity behavior analytics. Now it's just called entity behavior analytics, um, even though it still, still carries the U. Um, initially, it was profiling users over a certain period of time, see their actions, see what they do, um, identify those things that use, those specific users do individually. In our environments, um, we talked about users. Uh, you know, we have some really good users. Uh, I don't want to get down on users. Um, but at the same time, in every environment, our users do different things. For whatever reason, it's like a neighborhood or a community. Our users get together and they all seem to like talk and they all do the same things, they all do the same weird things. Over time, user entity behavior is going to track that stuff. So over time, you know exactly what that person did. If they do something that's an outlier, right? They do something that they normally wouldn't do, this entity behavior is going to tell you about that. Right? Instead of you having to go take a look at that. If something gets generated in the system, some alert about this user, you can go look at that user very quickly and look at the last 30 days. Oh, they've done this like 10 times. Oh, it's fine. Should be fine. So you can kind of carry on and move ahead. Again, from an efficiency standpoint, that allows you to carry on um, with your operations. We talked about the playbooks already. Um, uh, Sentinel has rules. It's more of a quicker, more efficient way. Playbooks are built on logic apps within um, Azure. I don't know if you're familiar with playbooks, but it's a no code or low code ability to be able to create very logical steps to create your automation. It's really easy to create things. I mean, you literally can create anything you want. Automation rules, you can still run playbooks from them, but these give you like really quick um, lists of things that you can do very quickly. You may get, for example, a, a certain type of alert or incident that gets generated in the system and, and you have a person on your team that is absolutely that person that always handles this thing. Maybe it's, uh, again, PowerShell, Cloud Shell, or something like this. You have that PowerShell person. You know what processes are involved in running PowerShell. You know what scripts that they should be able to run and stuff like this. Create an automation rule to automatically, every time that thing comes in, assign it to that person. Right? That's just quick automation. That should literally exist everywhere. That's going to save you a lot of time. Instead of having that invest, investigative analyst look at the incidents every morning and say, oh, that goes to him. Let me do this. You know, that takes away at least a good hour or so, maybe probably longer of your time every morning. Right? It's pretty good. Um, 
There are a number of companies today, we got like 20 seconds, a uh, number of companies today that will not deploy anything unless it's part of the DevOps or CI CD pipeline, right? Um, and that's important. Uh, we have a thing in Microsoft Sentinel called repositories, and literally you can take anything that you create within Microsoft Sentinel, stick it out on GitHub or a DevOps board, um, and it will be deployed to however many um, Microsoft Sentinel instances you have in your organization. It's great for creating uniform tools across the organization. It's also, um, it's also a good way to, for another part or piece of your organization, another group or something, to be able to create something that, you know, they use that KQL query, they've created something based on those indicators of compromise, they stick it in their GitHub repository, and now it, it spans out to all the other um, Microsoft Sentinel instances in your organization. Uh, the MITRE attack stuff, Everything that we do within Microsoft Sentinel is based on the MITRE Tech framework, so you know it is has a really good basis, uh, industry basis on that. And in fact, there's a tool within Microsoft Sentinel where you can go in and click on the different MITRE Tech framework tactics, and it will tell you your exposure to those areas within your environment. If you need a rule, if you don't have a rule, if you have a bunch of them for that one, you can identify, and again, from efficiency standpoint, that gives you a really good map to start to define your security operations center. I know we're one minute over. Um, I could have gone longer, I apologize. Uh, again, I would love to talk to you if you guys have any other questions and things like that. Um, I'll stop talking. Any questions? Any more questions? Again, thank you so much everyone for having me and thank you for being here, this is awesome. All right, everybody, we're gonna take a 15 minute break. If oh, I had 15 minutes? <laughs>